maybe if you can tell us a little bit more about exactly what the expectation is for, for gauging efficacy. Um, obviously, there's no magic number for exactly showing absolute benefit and reason for, for mass manufacturing or application into even our healthcare workers. But what do you think that would look like? Imagine? Well, all vaccines don't look alike. Uh, we have the measles vaccine. You get two doses and you're protected for life. That is a dynamite vaccine. And then we have influenza vaccine, which for a variety of reasons has effectiveness depending upon the population to whom you give it, older people versus younger people. But let's just say for the purpose of discussion, about 45, 50%. And so that's the best that science can produce now. We wouldn't want a vaccine only that effective. We would deal with it if it's the only vaccine available, I think but we would hope for something that's over 80% effective. That could get people excited. And by people, I mean the average Joe and Jane out there who are going to have those needles go into their arms. Uh, we have to, I think, today in the 21st century, have a product that's at least 80% effective. They would even hope for more, of course. And then you have to assess it not only in adults, but in children. And you have to look at immunocompromised people, older people who usually don't respond as well. So there are all kinds of subgroups where you have to look at effectiveness. That's great. And every once in a while, well, let me just add a footnote to that, if I may. You can get a vaccine, the most recent shingles vaccine, Shingrix, is an incredibly effective vaccine, even in people who are older. It's got an adjuvant in it, an immune stimulant. And when that vaccine's results came out, I mean, people almost stood up and cheered. And of course, that's why it's been in such great demand. So if we had a vaccine that were that good, that would be fabulous. And then one last thing, okay, let's say we have a vaccine that's 95% effective, just for fun. How long does the protection last? Is this a vaccine we're going to have to get revaccinated or boosted at a periodic interval? We won't know that at the beginning. That'll be one of those stay tuned and we'll tell you in a year or two years whether you have to roll up your sleeve again and get another dose. And it's interesting, too, because there's just so much more to learn about overall body immunity in response to the disease, uh, even people who have recovered. Uh, what exactly their standing is and if, if they would be eligible or required to get a vaccination if we did have something so efficacious. So, exactly. Yeah. I guess, I guess interesting in a morbid way would be the way I'd put it, but um, nonetheless, yeah. Well, I, I hope we're interested because that's the way science works. If we're interested, we'll work on trying to find what the solutions are. That's a good way to put it. Thank you. And um, maybe if we can turn back now to the candidates at hand, um, you know, there was uh, two other candidates uh, from the same class being discussed this week, and that was the mRNA uh, trials that started off one from Moderna and the other were from uh, Pfizer and BioNTech. Right. Uh, slightly different, but maybe if we started with the Moderna, did, did you have any time to look that over? And, and um, you know, anything? Well, the, the Moderna vaccine is one that the NIH is very interested in. Right. <clears throat> and, and Tony Fauci has and, and the United States government has invested some monies in a public private partnership with those folks. And that's a vaccine that is novel because uh, what it does is. And, and there are no other precedent vaccines like this. You inject genetic material, which then gets integrated into our cells. We produce the protein which is usually the vaccine, and then we also produce the antibody. And that's been a, a mechanism that people have been working on, that and the DNA vaccines, uh, for quite some time. Uh, but we don't have a licensed product using that technology yet. And so the investigators have a fair amount of experience in working with these materials, and these vaccines are already in clinical trials. Yeah. Yeah. So something more of a, a familiar candidate to turn to as, um, you know, honestly, it's, it seems like the mRNA candidates would have been considered even back in February before this was a more chieftain concern, uh, at least in our country. 
yes, I would think so. Exactly. But I mean, that mRNA vaccine is now already in phase two trials. Yeah. So they've gone past that first group and are now giving it to a larger group of folks. Yeah. And, and something that was interesting, if we, if we switch over a second to the Pfizer and BioNTech uh, assessment that's going on right now is the stratification for age to assure uh, safety uh, in the younger adult population before they considered it in the older one. And as such, they can work with developing results over a period of time instead of waiting for a larger comprehensive understanding of its benefits. Is this something that's pretty similar in other vaccines where we see age stratification difference for safety and efficacy? I mean, I'm Oh, sure. yes, for sure. Uh, it's often the case that people who can make their own decisions, adults, uh, are offered the vaccine first in the trials, and then you can work to other more sensitive population, children, pregnant women, for example, and you want to assure the safety and hopefully the effectiveness of the vaccines in adults first. And you can choose older adults or younger adults. It's usually you start with middle-aged adults. They're supposed to be strong enough and have the ability to make those uh, decisions. As you get into older adults, of course, those people be come come along with their chronic underlying illnesses, they may not respond optimally, so they may be in a second group. But here, in many of these trials, older adults are included because obviously they're among the most vulnerable to coronavirus infections.